Hi there, so this is the second video in this series of probability theory and in this video I'm going to be talking about types of events. So in the previous video we defined what probability is and we also defined this thing called an event which is the outcome uh, of a random experiment or a set of outcomes. So if you toss a coin for example uh, you could have getting a head as an event or getting a tail as an event. If you roll a dice you could have um, uh, getting an even number as your event. So it's important to talk about these types of events because everything we deal with in probability is in some sense an event. We are always working with uh, events in probability. So let's, let's go through the various types of events and uh, where necessary we'll talk about a few of their properties which will be useful later in the course as we start to do a bit of numerical examples. So the first type of events that I want to talk about is what we would call, um, okay this is kind of disturbing, hopefully, okay. So this is something called sure events. I hope that's visible, okay. So the first type of event I want to talk about is this called sure events. Well, as the name suggests, sure means you're sure that this event is going to occur. So sure events are those with a probability of 1. Uh, they are events whose probability is equal to 1 because they are always going to occur. Let me give you an example. The probability that um, a day will have 24 hours, that's almost something that has always been true. Uh, and, and, you know, we've not seen that fail. Okay, anyway, of course... I understand there are some days in a year that could be longer than others, but on average, a day will have 24 hours. So if you're given all the days in a year and they tell you to, to, to pick a day with 24 hours, you know, you'll always get a day, uh, all days have the 24 hours, so your probability will be 1. So sure events are events with a probability of 1 because they are always going to occur. And speaking of sure events, I should also talk about... Uh, impossible events. Now, this is actually the opposite. Impossible events are those that uh, have a probability of zero because they will never occur. So, an example is, uh, let's say, let's say you define E to be the event that you roll a seven on a dice. I mean, you will never roll a seven on a dice because it has dots from one to six. So you can roll a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, or a 5, or a 6, but you cannot roll a 7, so that's an impossible event. So, yeah, impossible events have probability of 0, while sure events have a probability of 1. Okay, so I kind of wanted to bring these ones first because they are kind of the simpler kinds of events. So let's move ahead and talk about more interesting events. Uh, let's talk about independent events. So, independent events. And this is important because a lot of um, numerical examples will show up uh, with, you know, some of them will have independent events in them. So, what do we mean by independent events? Well, still, as the name suggests, these are events uh, where the occurrence of one event does not affect the occurrence of the other. So, I'll give you an example here. Uh, let's suppose we are tossing a coin, so a coin has a head and a tail. So, let's say I toss the coin for the first time. I think I got a coin here. So, yeah, I have a coin here. So, let's say I toss this coin the first time and I get maybe a tail. And I, I now, if I'm to toss this coin for the second time, I could still get a head or a tail regardless of what my first outcome was. So the, the, the second time I roll this coin, I could still get a head or a tail regardless of the previous outcome. In other words, the first tossing and the second tossing are independent. Okay. Now, of course, that's built on the assumption that this is a balanced coin. There is no bias, you know, uh, Maybe the center of gravity of this is not twisted in such a way that I'm likely to get one outcome more than the other, something like that. So the event that I will toss either a head or a tail 
is independent of the previous experiments or tossings that I've done with this uh, this coin. Uh, and for calculation purposes, let me just put this here. So if you have A and B, and let's say A and B are independent events, so if A and B are independent, then, um, okay, just put this off also. So if A and B are independent events, then the probability of A intersection B. We'll talk about intersection and union of events more in the next video, but we can briefly talk about it. An intersection means having two of these occur at the same time. So the probability of A intersection B is given as the probability of A times the probability of B, which kind of makes sense. Remember, we said in the previous video, or well, something you should know is that the probability of an event is always uh, ranging from 0 to 1. So most likely the probability of A is a fraction, a number less than 1 per se, and likewise the probability of B. So if I multiply two numbers that are less than 1, then the number I get is even much smaller. If I multiply two numbers uh, that are each between 0 and 1, let's say the probability of getting A, sorry, the probability of event A is 1 half, and maybe the probability of event B is also 1 half, you see the result is one quarter, which is much smaller than each of these. This makes sense because A and B are independent events. So to actually have them occur at the same time is really hard. So the chances of, of, of having that must be really small. So kind of uh, the, the logic or the reasoning behind this. But this is a, um, a very important property when it comes to independent events. We'll continue to explore this in more videos ahead. So this is what we call independent events. So you have two events such that the occurrence of one event doesn't affect the next event. I give an example of tossing a coin, a balanced coin. Uh, tossing any, uh, at any given time will not depend on what you've got previously when you tossed the same coin. Okay, so let's move on to the next type of event. Now, speaking of independent events, we should also speak of dependent. So we have dependent events. And basically, as you can see from the name, dependent events are those where um, the occurrence of one event depends on the other. Uh, so a quick example here, let's say you have Let's say you have a box, okay, so let's say we have this probably a tin, and you have maybe, uh, you have some apples and tomatoes in the same tin, so you have apples and tomatoes. Let's say I pick out one tomato from this tin here, so the probability that I pick a tomato, if picking a tomato is the event we are interested in, well, there are two tomatoes out of the four fruits that I could have picked from. So the probability is, is two over four or one half. Now, let's say I pick and I don't replace this back. So now we have, uh, now we have uh, two apples and one tomato. So if I pick again a tomato, the probability of picking a tomato, so that was the first time, Picking a tomato for the second time, I don't know if you can still see this, okay, I think so. So the probability will now be one out of three because now I have, I have only three fruits left. One fruit was removed on the first event. So as you can see, the second event, the probability of the second event is affected because of the first event that occurred. So yeah, two events are, are, are called dependent events if the occurrence of one event will definitely affect <coughs> sorry will definitely affect the occurrence of the of the other event or the next event okay so that's uh dependent events next we look at um let's talk about mutually exclusive events 
So you have mutually exclusive events. So two events, so let's call them A and B. I'm just going to use this as to sketch this. So let's say you have event A and you have event B. And let's say event A is a set of even numbers less than 6. So you have 0, 2, and 4. And let's say B is a set of odd numbers less than 6. We only have 1, 3, and a 5. As you can see from here, these two sets do not have any elements in common. So A intersection B is actually an empty set. So that means the probability of getting um, a member that is in both A and B will actually be zero. So mutually exclusive events are, you know, if you have events uh, that do not have any elements in common, we call those mutually exclusive. And it's not just limited to, it's not just limited to two events, it could be any number of events if you had to generalize this. Uh, let's see if you can still see that. So uh, let's say the probability of event A1, intersection A2, intersection A3, and so on, is always going to be a zero. So, okay, so that works for uh, mutually exclusive events, events that do not have any elements in common or sample points in <coughs> in common okay so that's mutually exclusive events let's move on to another type of event and that's going to be complementary events which are very similar to this except for one difference so Okay, we have complementary events. So two events are said to be complementary if, um, if, if one of them will occur, if and only if the other one does not occur. So a good example of complementary events is, let's say, let's say tossing a coin. Yeah, that's a good example. So if you toss a coin, you could, sorry about that, at the time of this recording, I have kind of a, a cough. Uh, so tossing a coin is a good example of a uh, complementary event. So a complementary events are those such that if one does not occur then the other one must occur. And I was saying tossing a coin is a good example because you either get a head or a tail. So if you don't get a head obviously a tail must be the only other outcome or if you don't get a tail then you must get a head. So so two events such as A and A complement, that's how we represent <coughs> the complement of an event. We use this or we could use this. We don't want to use that. So two events such as A and A complement, uh, we read that as A complement, by the way. So these are complementary events because if this doesn't occur, definitely this must occur. And if does, this doesn't, then this must occur. That's how we, we define uh, complementary events. A set of events such that if one doesn't occur, then the other must occur or take place. Next, I want us to look at exhaustive events. So, exhaustive events are events such that if you put them together, they will form the sample space. So, if... So, let's say you have events A, B, C. So, if A, B, C are exhaustive events, Then, um, if you get A union B union C, this should give you the sample space. So if you have any number of events, it could be two or more events, any number of events such that if you put them together, they will give you the sample space, then we call those events exhaustive. In other words, 
they exhaust the entire sample space. That's how I like to think about it. Exhaustive events, they exhaust the entire sample space. You know, there are some events where we could have elements that don't exist in any of the events, but rather just outside, you know, sort of. Uh, let me give you this uh, illustration here. So, let's say you have this, and you have maybe uh, three sets, A, B, and C. So you could have events here, 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 you know, in any portion of the Venn diagram. But you could also have some events that are outside the Venn diagram. That's a possible thing. Okay? But we are saying that for exhaustive events, you don't have any elements outside here. All the elements must lie between A, B, and C. Or if there are more sets, all the events uh, must be, sorry, all the elements of the sample space must be contained within the sets A, B, and C, or within the events A, B, and C. Uh, so exhaustive events exhaust the entire sample space. Events such that when you put them together, you form the entire sample space are called exhaustive events. All right, so we have two more types of events to go. So we have simple events. So simple events are events that have just one sample point. For example, the probability of getting a number less than 2 when you roll a dice is, you know, the probability of, uh, well, let's not talk about the probability, but rather the sample points or the outcomes of the event. So the event of rolling a number that is less than 2 on a dice I mean, there's only one possibility, which is a 1. You have only one number, which is less than 2, and that's a 1 on a dice. So it has only one sample point. So an event which has only one sample point is called a simple event. On the contrary, we have what we call compound events. So compound events are those events which have more than one sample point. For example, um... The probability of getting an even number when you roll a dice, you have, if, if, if your event is getting an even number, then you could get a 2, a 4, or a 6. Uh, all that is possible. All those are the sample points in that event. So, compound events are those that have more than one uh, sample points for them. Well, the last category of events I want to talk about are equal likely events. Okay, so we have this equal likely events, and as you can suggest from the name already, uh, these are events that have equal chances of happening. For example, tossing a coin, you could get a tail, the probability of getting a tail is one half, and the probability of getting a head is also one half. So the two events have equal likelihood to occur, so we call those uh, equal likely events. So I think that brings us to the end of this video. In the next video, we'll look at union and intersection of events and hopefully start to do some calculations. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. See you in my next one. Have a good time.